Good morning. God bless you and welcome to Online Church Today. Everybody, we welcome you from all around the world. It's so good to have you with us. It sure is. Today our theme is vision. And missions. Yeah, so round up the family. We're going to start with some praise today. And the first song is... Nothing, Nothing is impossible. Amen. <laughs> It's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible Right now, I think it's time for us to pray. Yeah, because there's nothing that our God can't do. So as we sing this next song, let's open our hearts to receive what we need from him today as we worship him. Father, Amen. I thank you for thank those you, that need healing. Lord, I thank you that you are our healer. 
Lord, when you died on the cross, you paid the price, you did it all. And Father, we thank you for that healing being manifest today in the name of Jesus. All symptoms leave, pain and sickness leaves in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for your healing right now in Jesus' name. Yes, Father, and we pray today for anybody that's in need of a financial breakthrough, yes, thank for you, anybody Lord. that's in God need of a breakthrough with their real estate, with their business, mm-hmm. with their education, everybody that's studying, Father, we pray that you would give them lots of vision, lots of wisdom, lots of ability, and we pray today, Father, for your supernatural work in this meeting, this online service, Father, that everybody today could experience your presence, could meet with you, yes. and hear a great word together in Jesus' name. For those that needed just encouragement today, yes, just Lord. receive, receive from God. Just spend time in His presence. Open your heart. He loves you. He loves you so much. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There is nothing, nothing that, that our God, God can't do. surrounds me Just one word The darkness has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes are open to see My heart that he can move oh praise the name that makes a way there's nothing that a god can do just one word you hear what's broken inside me just one word and you revive every dream Oh, praise the Lord. 
You may have lost your vision and need to pick it up or you may need to seek God for fresh vision for your life. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. Some versions say, where there's no vision, the people run amok. One of the first steps to moving forward is to receive vision from God. Find out His plan for your life and then begin the process of gearing up for it. If you do, you'll be beginning forward motion into all that He has for you. to capture the dream that God has for you. Sometimes we dream, but are disappointed when it doesn't eventuate, especially when we have conscientiously and diligently done our best to see it fulfilled. Beginning to dream again is difficult after this happens. The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. You may not understand why something didn't happen when we dreamed it, but we have to pick ourselves up and dream again. You may think that it is too painful to get up and dream again, but you must. Take hold of your destiny. You see, often when we receive a big vision from God, we are full of excitement and expectation, but seldom realize that we have to go through a process to prepare ourselves to fulfill it. A vision from God is always bigger than we are. The process of preparation, faith, growing pains and patience shapes and refines us, develops our character, giving us the temperament and skills we need to fulfill the dream. Every part of the process is important. It isn't very easy when trouble comes your way. It isn't very easy But after dark there's day And you can change your destiny It isn't very easy When all seems negative It isn't very easy To remain positive The Bible says that without a vision the people perish. We need to reactivate the desire to dream envision positive change and grow into it. Abraham didn't simply believe for a baby. He believed that he would become, that he would become a father of many nations. Romans 4.18 says, Who against hope believed in hope that he, Abraham, might become the father of many nations. I'm gonna keep on If nothing changes, 
nothing changes. I want to encourage you today that no matter where your life is at, how bad you think things are, you can change and your life can improve. By this time next year, everything can be better. It can start today. It may be small things or huge things that need to change. It may be your financial situation, your job, your ministry, relationships. There's many things that may need to change, but it starts with getting a fresh vision and then taking some action steps each day towards fulfilling it. do you want your life to look like in a year's time? Are there some things that you really want to change? If you don't purposefully look at it and see it and yourself differently, your life will look the same at the end of the year. Remember, it begins with vision. If you can't see it, you can't seize it. If you don't have a clear vision on which to move forward, you can get stuck or be diverted from the right path. It's important to get a vision and then to write it clearly. Write the vision. Then the Lord answered to me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but in the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That's from Habakkuk 2, 2 to 3. Corrie Ten Boom says, always live according to your vision, never according to your eyes. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Corrie was also quoted as saying, believe in the dark what God told you in the light. You have to stay focused on what God shows you and is now inside you not what you can see on the outside. God created you masterfully, and in so doing, He placed gifts within you. He has a plan for your life. He has creatively designed and gifted you perfectly to fulfill it. No matter what you need to overcome to get there, He desires to lead you and guide you into success and fulfillment. Psalm 66, 12 says, you allowed men to ride over our heads. We passed through fire and water, but you brought us out into a wide open space. You need to invest time with God. You need to spend time listening to Him so that He can guide you and direct you into His perfect will for your life. Make time to be alone with God. Listen to what He says to you in those quiet moments and then write it down. He has a vision for you. When you write the vision down, you can look at it at any given moment. Writing it and reviewing it regularly helps you gain and maintain perspective, which in turn helps you in your daily priorities. Because the next step is to put feet to your dream. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, you are our God. Promise 
God bless you. It's been a great time so far. After the next song, we're going to have today's message where I'll be preaching, but this is just a shortened version of the message. The full version of the message will be available on Facebook after church, and it will also be available on YouTube so you can catch the whole message when you can sit down and focus on that. But right now, let's focus on Jesus. Focus on the King of Kings Amen. as we sing this song, The Passion, and we just are reminded again of what He has done for us when He died on the cross. Thank you, Jesus.
Good morning. The title for my message is Vision for Eternity. You know, I was remembering when I was a brand new Christian and I got full of the Holy Spirit, after a very short period of time, what I later learned to be a burden for souls, as they used to call it, came on me. And I remember being depressed and going through my mind was, how are we going to win people to Jesus? I thought back to my early days of growing up in Sunday school and the closest I got to witnessing was once we went on a Sunday school picnic and I smiled at another guy, a non-Christian guy, and he punched me right in the face. I didn't even get to say anything to him. And then I remember when we travelled in our band before we were Christians, we travelled up to Mackay or Mackay, whatever you call it, and on Saturday nights as we were going into the hotel to play, there would be a street preacher across the street yelling and shaking his fist at everybody entering the hotel. And he just seemed to me to be totally repulsive. I kept thinking, how are we going to win people to Jesus? Jesus is not attractive. People don't want to come to him. And so I remember being there and I was quite depressed about this. And I thought to myself, all of a sudden, goodness, I've got to do something about this. Because one day I'll be sitting on a park bench looking sad and depressed. And someone will walk up to me and say, you need Jesus. I had Jesus. That wasn't the problem. Then we got that message in a Sunday sermon, I guess it was. God spoke to Moses and said, what have you got in your hand? Moses, of course, had a staff. Or you could say it a stick. What have you got in your hand? Just a stick. And so we asked ourselves, what have we got in our hand? And we had a guitar. We had equipment. We had a repertoire of songs. We had a truck. We had lights. We had a road crew. We had a full band. We had plenty in our hand. And then we realized that we needed to do that. What I couldn't do alone, I could do with a team. We had a vision then. We were going to use our music to reach people for God. We were going to use our band, our truck, our equipment, our light show, our guitars, our sound gear, and all of our training and years of experience. And so we started to do outreach concerts and together we succeeded in winning people to Jesus. Now at that stage, I didn't know anything about discipling them, but we did start off some home groups. When I say home groups, we had one at our place, one at a friend's place. Then we started a youth group at church. And I guess through that, we were teaching and discipling people and winning people to Jesus on a weekly basis. So there is a vision from God. And when you understand what the vision is for yourself and for those around you collectively, then you can start to move forward and do what for you might seem impossible as an individual. Let's pray. Father, as we start looking at vision for eternity, we ask that you would open the eyes of our understanding today, that you would help us see your plan and how it's to be fulfilled and to understand today that you have a great plan for fulfilling what you want done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So let's have a look at a couple of scriptures today. And as we go to them, let's bear in mind two questions. Why do we need a vision? And the other question is, what is God's vision for us? Maybe also we need then to ask the questions of how do we go about fulfilling it? Who should do what? But that's not for today. Listen to what Jesus said, as you could say, a general view of this. In John chapter 435, he said, don't say there are four months until the harvest. Lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are white, ready for harvest. Now, of course, that's a picture of the harvest or the unsaved people are ready to get saved. But Jesus said to lift up your eyes. Eyes are for seeing. Jesus wanted his followers to first catch a vision for the lostness of the unsaved world. But not only that, to see that he is at work in them now. He's at work in people all around us, getting them ready and he's telling us that the harvest is ripe. And that's the first part of the vision we need to receive from Jesus today. The vision for winning souls and the harvest is ripe now. Nobody can convict people of their need to be saved, but the Holy Spirit. He's the one that works in their hearts. He's doing his work. What's our job? Number one, catch that vision. The harvest field 
is ready. The people in the district all around us, people next door, people at work, people at school, they're ready for harvest. Amen. Another great scripture that comes out of this is Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost just after he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And because it is the word of God, and as we know, all scripture is God breathed. That means inspired by the Holy Spirit. You could say this is what the Holy Spirit said. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass afterward, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. You know, then he goes on and on my handmaidens and on my servants, I'll pour out in those days of my spirit. They will prophesy and I will show. There's an element there of prophecy, but also of intercession and confessing God's word and speaking out the things that God works on. But today I want you to see clearly here that one of the first things the Holy Spirit will do is give vision and give dreams. Young men get a vision and young women of what they're going to do with their life, things that can be done, how to do this, what to do. Old men not starting their life still can dream of the way the Holy Spirit is showing them that things could be. When I was a young man, my father told me he had a dream. He said, I have a dream that one day we'll fill the Maya Music Bowl in Melbourne with praise to God. But Rosanna and I at that time were part of the Youth Alive team and we had a vision after a while to hold an event there. And you know what? My dad's dream and my vision, along with Mal Fletcher and Rosanna and Bruce Hills and several others, our vision and his dream coincided until the one great event happened and we had a great Youth Alive rally there and praise. And of course, later on, Benny Hinn came there and did the same kind of thing. And another group there had happening, 88 or whatever it was, they had huge events there in the Music Bowl. It was amazing. The old men will dream dreams and the young men will see visions. My dad didn't know anything about PAs and light shows and rehearsals. He just dreamed it. We had a vision for a great sound, a great rehearsal and a great presentation for souls to get saved and great follow up and all of that. But together, the young and the old working together, we saw it come to pass. Amen. Let's go now into the book of Acts and we're going to read about the Apostle Paul. Now, I touched on this a few weeks ago. This is crucially important because this is what Paul is saying in Acts chapter 26. Then he ends in verse 19, And so, King Agrippa, I obeyed the vision from heaven. Paul is saying that when he got saved, he was given this vision. His salvation happened in Acts chapter 9. And then all of his ministries recorded through the rest of the book of Acts to here. And then at the end of that time, he said, I obeyed the vision. So a vision from Jesus informed Paul of what he should do and led him throughout his life. He had that vision constantly before him to inform him, to inspire him, to motivate him, to empower him, to assure him he's on the right track. And he knew then what to do and he obeyed it for the rest of his life. Paul obeyed the vision Jesus gave him, as I said before. Now, what was the vision Jesus gave him? And I'm going to read it and we're going to look at it, okay? From Acts chapter 26, verses 18 to 19. The vision Jesus gave Paul went like this. Remember, he was a servant and a witness. He had to go where Jesus sent him. And there were times he didn't know where to go. He had to wait. He wanted to go into Asia or Bithynia or somewhere and the Holy Spirit kept stopping him. Then he had a dream in the night of a man from Philippi, Macedonia, saying, come and help us. So he determined that's where Jesus is sending me. So he just jumped the boat and went over there. And that's where the Philippians is. And the Philippian jailer and Paul and Silas thrown in prison and singing praise at night. It all happened under the grace and the glory of God because he obeyed where the Lord sent him. So what's this vision? Acts 26, 18 to 19, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive 
forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. You may remember reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, that Paul the Apostle said, The God of this world, which is Satan, has blinded the eyes or the minds of unbelievers. And remember, if they're blinded, it means no light is getting to them. They don't have revelation from God. Their understanding is darkened and they don't have vision. So they run off the track, you could say. So the first job is to open their eyes. And a lot of this is done through intercessory prayer for the unsaved and by preaching the gospel to them. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus and asked him, explain to me what's going on. I know you're a teacher. Teach me something. And Jesus didn't try to explain anything. He just simply said, you must be born again. It's like us debating with the world about some of the changes they've made to morality and laws in this nation. We can't argue with them on the same level. We simply have one message for the unsaved. You must be born again, because unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Vision. You cannot enter the kingdom of God without being born again. The second part of the vision Jesus gave Paul was to turn them from darkness to light. It's much the same thing. You get someone's eyes open and in prayer, preach the gospel to them. Light starts to come in. Revelation comes. And then when Jesus talked about feed the sheep, he's talking about keep up an ongoing flow of revelation to my babies, to my people, so that they will constantly have light coming in with revelation from the word. And with the word also comes life, healing, creativity and all kinds of amazing empowering comes with that and the grace to fulfill the call of God and the grace to be holy. Amen. Turn them from the power of Satan unto God. There is only two kingdoms. There's not Liberal versus Labor, Ford versus Holden, you know, Collingwood versus Carlton. It's not the Democrats versus the Republicans. In God's mind, it's his kingdom and the usurper's kingdom, that's Satan the devil, who stole the kingdom off Adam and deceived him out of it. Jesus came and won it back as the head of a new kingdom. And we now are here to occupy like occupation forces and to take back what Jesus got back bit by bit. And remember, Jesus owns the property, he owns the people, and he owns the positions of power. It all belongs to him. Amen. Now, the reason we're doing all this opening eyes and turning them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins, in other words, get reconciled to God, and an inheritance amongst those who are sanctified by faith. Inheritance is good. Amen. The third point here is the elder's vision. We read about that one from Paul and one from Peter. And this is what Paul said to the elders at Ephesus. Keep a watch over yourselves. That's the word overseer. Sometimes as you're reading the New Testament, you'll see the word bishop. It's Greek episkopos, which means overseer, watching over. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This is Acts 20, 28. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. The job for the elders, it says here, is overseeing. Because, you know, an older person has a brain that's better able to deal with overview. The second job for the elder was shepherding, caring, nurturing the flock. Amen. He also says to them to be examples to the flock. And that's something we all should take on board. So our vision. What's our vision for eternity? What's the vision Jesus is giving us? Well, well, before we get into anything too specific, let's just remind ourselves of a few of the other general parts of the vision. We've got Jesus saying in John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24, to worship God in spirit and truth. So our vision always has to include worship. And I believe that because we are Westerners, sometimes we can see this as an individual thing, but somebody in Jesus' culture and at Jesus' time wouldn't have seen that because they thought in group thinking that they thought we worship God. They weren't on Western individualism. They're on Eastern 
group thinking and many of the islands have group thinking as well. The second part of the generic vision is love one another. As Jesus said in John chapter 13 verse 35, we must never forget that even when we undertake specific roles and tasks in church life, loving one another is crucially important. God is love. He who does not love has not been born again and is not of God. This is one of the acid tests of our life. Do we have love for God's family like he does? And you know, Jesus warned that in the end times, that's the times we're living in, obviously by the riots and the fires and all the things that are shaking around us. Jesus warned in our times, the love of many will grow cold. In some translations say the love of most will grow cold. Let's make it our vision to never let our love grow cold and always have fervent love for one another and love each other fervently. That's the same thing twice. Amen. Also, a generic vision is remember the poor. We've got to look after the poor. We've got to look after widows and orphans, according to James chapter 1, verse 27. And we know that the overall commission is to reach the whole world. So part of our vision for eternity is to support missionaries. So, so important because we can't, each one of us, go to every ethnic group, but we can all do something to support the worldwide effort to reach the world with the gospel. So it's important we do our part in giving to, supporting, praying for and encouraging our missionaries. We have to also pray for the spiritual blindfold to be removed from them. I can't tell you how many times we prayed that in our concerts, how much prayer and fasting we did. I'm not trying to brag, but just to give an impression. We had a vision to win our generation to Jesus. And we knew it was a lot more than just playing music. I've even heard the leader of Planet Shakers say, some people think our crowd is here because of smoke, lights and loud music. He said, it's not. He said, I'm the pastor, I ought to know. The loud music, smoke and lights might bring somebody in and keep them for a couple of weeks, but that's not what gets people saved. He said, it's faith. You've got to be hungry for salvations. And he told us at the National Conference that Planet Shakers are seeing hundreds of people saved every week because he's got a thousand people out at prayer meeting on Wednesday morning at 6.30 crying out to God for souls for one hour. That's what's behind it. And his own personal faith is constantly believing for salvations. This is part of opening their eyes, removing the blindfold. You've got to do it. It can't be overlooked. Amen. We've got to make disciples of people. We've got to have a structure so that disciples can be made. When I was pastoring my first church, I realized that this is a big job. You know, when you talk about discipling a family, one person might be good at discipling youth, but they're not good with elderlies. At the same time, they're not good with children. Another person is good with children. Another person is great for ministering to the elderlies. Somebody's good at ministering to the men, the women. And we've got to train, disciple, equip, nurture, love, care for, make sure everybody's spiritual life is nurtured and cared for. And then because we love the Holy Spirit and because we are 100% behind him, we acknowledge the fact that he puts different gifts in different people. You know, he gave some to be facilitators, some teachers, some prophets, and he gave some evangelists, some pastors, he gave teachers and mercy. I'm mixing the gift list up. Some have got the gift of hospitality, some like serving. We will talk about that in the future, but we must acknowledge and understand that these are gifts given by the Holy Spirit. If we love the Holy Spirit, it should be our vision to see every one of those gifts discovered, developed and deployed into their function to encourage people in this, to train them, equip them, give them an opportunity, stand beside them. Remember, when you plant a small tree, back in the day before vandals, you just had to put a stake in next to it. The stake they put next to the little tree doesn't add any nutrition, doesn't add any moisture, it doesn't give sunlight, it doesn't help the tree grow in any way whatsoever, 
but because it's there, the tree grows. If you take it away, it will probably blow over under the pressure of wind. And that's what it's like sometimes to stand beside people. Once we've trained them and we've equipped them and we've nurtured them, we've put them out there, we're inspiring them in worship, we're giving them the word of God, we're imparting Jesus' vision. Then we stand beside people as their gifts come on, as their gifts develop until their gifts can be expressed fully and they can be part of the overall vision of the church. They may be the missionary. They may be caring for the poor, the widows, the orphans. They may be used in a healing gift. They may be a prophet. They may be a cleaner, a server. They may be a great usher. They may be a great person for doing follow-up or preaching. Whatever their gift is from the Holy Spirit, we love him. We respect him. He has first place and we want his gifts to be discovered in people, to be developed and then to be deployed into their function so that everybody can benefit. And then when a new person gets saved, they give their life to Jesus. They come into the church. The evangelist, of which church life usually has about one in ten people are good evangelists. And if they all bring in somebody, then generally the evangelist is not good at following them up after a few weeks. They're out there hunting new souls to be saved. They're fishing for new fish. Amen. They're doing their ministry. Let them go. But we need them for the elders, for the care teams, for the pastoral team. But importantly, somebody to establish them, somebody to teach them the basics, somebody to bring them through and help them grow as a disciple of Jesus through our home group network, through training, through discipleship and on into gift development, gift deployment and all. Oh, gift discovery and all of those things. We want to see people coming from fully unchurched people who don't know God all the way through to a fully qualified, fully functioning disciple of Jesus whose love is hot, whose vision is strong and whose desire to serve Jesus is second to none. They are a worshipper in spirit and in truth. They are full of the Holy Spirit. Their mind is on God. They live a holy life. They've got their eyes on Jesus and they just speak the word, live the word, confess the word. They give themselves over to prayer and the ministry of the word if they're somebody called into the ministry I am and they give themselves over to confessing the word of God, loving on God and doing their part to fulfill what it takes to see Jesus' vision fulfilled. And remember, Jesus' vision is for the whole world to get saved. So right here in our town, where we live in our neighborhood, it's obviously Jesus' vision for everybody to be saved. And our vision shouldn't exclude the possibility of the whole lot of them coming in. In other words, our vision must be one to grow in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I want to ask you a question as we finish. What's your vision? If you haven't got a vision from Jesus, maybe you don't even have the vision yet to avoid hell and the vision to be with him for eternity. But that's where it starts. Because remember, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you cannot see. You're blind to spiritual things in God's kingdom. You can't see the vision he has for your life and you can live a restless life. You can always be going from pillar to post, going north, going south, going left, going right. Or you might just feel life as unfulfilled, purposeless, I'm just a merry-go-round. Whatever it is, you must be born again for your eyes to be open. Then you can start to see. Because remember when Paul got saved, he didn't have a vision except killing Christians. It was doing the devil's bidding. When he got saved, first thing he knew, Jesus was Lord and that the Lord is the one that should be giving me the instruction. And God's instructions come as vision. Praise God. When should we receive the new birth? Now. 2 Corinthians 6 chapter 2 says, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. How do we receive the new birth? Easy. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, this is Romans 10, 9 and 10, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, how do we know that's the truth? Because God is promising it. He said, if this will happen, if you, then I will, right? This is an absolute ironclad promise from God. If you yield to him, he will save you. For with the heart one believes to righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
Will Jesus and God answer if you cry out to him today? Yes. As many as received him, to them he gave the right. So all you have to do is receive him and you get the right to become a child of God. Acts 2.39, for the promise is to you and your children. Acts 2.21, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There is God's guarantee to you. If you call, you will be saved. I'm going to repeat that. If you call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved and you confess him as Lord. And that means not, Lord, give me a list of things to do and I'll do them. But it's saying to him, Lord, I give you permission to start to control my life by your spirit in my inner man. And then he will lead you by giving you your heart's desire. In other words, he puts a desire in there and he changes you and starts to stir up those gifts so that they can be released and used. So today, let's do it right now. All of this can be fulfilled in a simple prayer. I'm going to encourage you to say this prayer after me. Again, you might hear Rosanna's voice in the background saying it too. So say this, Jesus, I confess today that you are Lord. I receive you today as my Lord. I receive your new birth. I want to be the child of God. Forgive me for everything I've done wrong. Today, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me, that you rose from the dead, and from this point forward, you are my Lord, and I'm following the vision you show me. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for listening today. If you said that prayer today and really meant it, tell someone, write to us on Facebook, text someone, ring someone up, tell someone there in the room with you that I am born again because it's important to start being a witness right now and telling people straight away what's happened to you. Words that you speak will seal it in your heart. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks a lot for watching this online service. We'll look forward to your company and your participation next week. In the meantime, keep loving people, keep ringing people, keep encouraging people. Keep your eye on our Facebook page where there's lots of teaching, there's little movies, there's things you can watch, there's Rosanna's ministry too, and everybody can put their things on there and be available to each other to love and encourage and put on photos of what you're up to. We love you. God bless you. Thanks again to all of our visitors today. See you next time. Bye. There's a song within my heart begging to be sung The words come stumbling out sometimes flowing one by one The love you put out found its way to my heart I could not lose it I could not depart You are amazing Your love Yeah.